Hi, my name is Jeff with Big Hairy Dog. This is a Big Hairy Dog webinar, and we are talking about version 9, purchasing, receiving, inventory creation today. Uh, certainly, if you have questions, throw them in the chat, or go ahead and just ask. I'm, I'm very flexible. Our job is to communicate today. If we don't communicate, we're not doing our job. So if it, what I'm saying does not make sense to you, it probably doesn't make sense to somebody else, and therefore, we should make sure we all understand, right? Okay, so um, our um, our goal here is to go through uh, inventory creation, which means uh, departments, vendors, items, and styles, then some advanced features in inventory, then purchase orders and receiving, and so we'll just start diving into that stuff, I guess, and uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes, right? So in um, inventory, I've I've got my screen set up a little bit custom. This is a a version of Big Hairy Dogs default layouts um, where I have an inventory button that gives me direct access to inventory but uh, and uh, and I've got uh, my vendors and departments over here so I guess we'll start with departments now uh, I guess I should ask real fast before we go too fast and too too quick is the resolution okay for everybody is everybody seeing the screen fine you know if you, if, if you're not say something if you're okay with it then just ignore my comment and we won't worry about it right so all right, well, we're going to move on. So thank you for that response, by the way. All right, so um, uh, merchandise, departments, department categories. So departments, hope we all understand it, but if we don't, let's make, take a quick second. To, I, I warn you, this data here is not the best data. This is just uh, demonstration data, and it's got a lot of junk in it. But um, still, there's several uh, good examples here of, of uh, department codes. Department codes typically... Uh, uh, the, the primary D or department, whether it be accessories, I'm not sure what ACT is. Uh, active, nice, active, okay, active wear. So we have active wear, then we have apparel, and then we have different kinds of uh, subclasses. Now, typically, if we're going to do that, we would have a, a different um, like class in there, too. So that's not really the best example. Uh, down here, we've got uh, baseball, equipment, baseball, shoe. Right there, that's a better example. Um, but I mean, a, a category is a it's a fundamental building block to any retail organization. I was a store manager. I was a, a, a department manager. I was a salesperson for years in three different big organizations in retail. And uh, you know, a a department or a category is a mini department. You know within the bigger store. It's a vertical little business within a bigger one. Like the ladies department in a department store is its own little shop right in the bigger department store setting. So uh, tracking uh, the, the departments are, is critically important. Um, and, and of course, the, the hierarchy here lets us report on this highest level, or we can break the highest level down to the class level, or we can break it all the way down to the subclass level, depending on how much detail we want in a report. Or in filtering, or in looking for goods. So uh, let's talk about department codes real quick. As we set them up, um, we would typically give them a name. So whatever we we're going to do, like uh, men's uh, tab, and then we would. Uh, so we get a code and a name. I guess I should say more specifically. This is the code. This is the name, right? And then we could say uh, tops, right? And and then we could say T or something here, right? Now, um, a couple of other points that are most important probably would be whether the item defaults to a status of taxable or exempt. And you can create your own tax code. So in here, in this, you see we have beverages as has been added as a tax code. So mostly people are taxable or exempt, to be honest. Um, I do have a couple of situations where like apparel was taxable in one store and not in another because they were in different states and we had to make an apparel tax code. Um, and New York tax is just messed up. I don't know what to say about that. Um, anyway, um, for the most part, then, I don't use a lot of these other settings. Use decimal quantity as a default, but most things default to not using decimal quantity, and most things don't have an allocation pattern. However, margin markup and coefficient, in version 9, I highly recommend putting something in here. So um, notice the coefficient is already populated. So first off, let's just... Take um, and make it a quick example. 
until we all understand these three, right? So what is margin markup and coefficient? They are all the same thing. Okay, if anybody hasn't figured that out, I'm going to tell you right now, they're all the same thing. So let's just say we have an item, and that item, the price of that item is $100. Okay, let's just say the cost of that item is $40. That means the margin on the item would be $60. So, so far the math is working for everybody, right? Okay. So, so margin percent then, well, 60 compared to 100 would be 60%, right? We're on board with that. So far, so good, right? Okay. Markup. Markup percent. Uh, I can't type, but that's all right. So markup percent would be what? Well, 40, um, Well, our market was 150%, by the way. So, so yes. So, uh, right, right. The 40, uh, 60 compared to the to the 40. Okay, I'm having a math challenge day, but but 60 is 150% of 40, correct? So, so that's what markup is. By the way, nobody uses markup much than I set up out there, but that's what that is. Okay, the coefficient. Also called a multiplier would be 2.5. So 2.5 times 40 is 100, right? That's how you get the price, right? Very sweet number, by the way. I highly recommend using coefficient. We all talk in margins, but a lot of us use coefficients in the background. All right, so now that we know what those are and we're pretty comfortable with that, um, here's the issue. It's already got a coefficient in there. So if you don't give it something, then when you put the cost in, it's going to suggest the price as cost. And if you don't change it, you're selling it at cost. So bare minimum, just put a two here, right? That would be pretty standard, like, you know, Keystone is pretty standard, right? Double the cost to get the price. It's not 100%, and it's not carving this in stone. It just suggests the price when you put an item in. You're still the human being. Last time I checked, you still get to make the decision, right? So, so just don't have it default to cost. That's what I'm going to say. Um, now, the smart person, I'm going to cancel this and say yes, we don't care, and go back to list. The smart person probably would go through here and set their margins appropriately. Like some of these would be at 62, some would be at 48, 47, depending on the category. If you're in dog food, maybe you're down lower. Maybe you're down in the you know 20s or 30s. You know, there's some pretty pretty saturated markets out there that have some pretty slim margins. Uh, but you want it to uh, suggest pricing appropriately when possible, or at least not at cost. Okay, now set on that. Sorry, I get in the soapbox sometimes, and I have to uh, rein myself in. So, um, fair enough, right? Okay, so we set up our categories. If you don't have your categories set up, you always, obviously want to, you want to make sure people know these, that they understand them. Preferably, they're, they're alpha, like mine are alpha. They don't have to be. They could be numeric. But um, everybody should know your department codes. The, the people that work there should understand the structure. This is part of the culture of the company, right? All right, enough said. Get out of here. Um, vendor codes are a whole lot easier. Vendor codes, we would we'd come out here and we'd click new. Um, I'm just going to grab one. It looks like it's got some data, maybe. Uh, we would say new. We would put in a code for the vendor. We would put the name of the vendor in here and the address pretty much goes without an explanation what an address is. Um, first and last name here can be a contact. You got a couple of phone numbers. The important stuff here would be um, this field here. That's the account number that the vendor has assigned to you. That's your account number with them. So if we populate that here in the vendor database, then when we print a PO, we can push that to the PO. Thus, we can speed the process up. When they get a PO that has the account number right on the top, then that's going to speed up their processes on their end. It's going to get your PO into their system faster. They're going to find you quicker. Um, payment terms, if we default the terms here, so if I say no percent for 30 days or 320 days, yes, yeah, sweet, sweet terms. All right, so uh, then when I make a PO, it's going to default my PO to those default terms. 
Of course, I can change it on the PO. I can change it on the receiving. I can change it on the former receiving voucher, right? I can change it at any point during the process, uh, all four points here, PO, receiving, and then history document. The rest of this is just yours to hack up as you see fit, basically. <clears throat> user-defined field, UDF is a user-defined field. I could go into system preferences, rename that to be rep cell phone, and then put their cell phone numbers there, right, if I wanted to. Obviously, the notes section is a um, place where you can just put in notes. Um, 244 characters, I think, go into a note field. It's not unlimited, but it's pretty, pretty generous. All right, so then you'd save that. You'd have a vendor code. Okay, let's pop out of here. Let's go into inventory so I can go to merchandise inventory but again I've given myself a direct button right there so I can just bypass the, the two click and go right into the one click and we are immediately taken to inventory inventory is a big spreadsheet looking thing it's not exactly a spreadsheet looks like it um, it is a list of items um, this is item view meaning that there is also a style view right so here, when I click on one member of this, when I click on any member of this item or any member of this item, the appropriate related items are highlighted, if that makes sense to everyone. So, um, oh, some questions, sorry. Uh, do, you have, uh, do you have to set the department level? Our company does not use standard markups. No, you don't, but if you leave it blank, you're gonna be suggesting costs. So, you don't have to set it, no, but I would I would set it to Keystone then, just set it to 50 on everything. If somebody screws up, I'd rather have them screw up at overpricing the item than selling it for cost. Uh, we are we are used to doing it at the item level. Yeah, so totally. You know, I guess I'm gonna have to add then, you know, if it's not broke. I just would strongly recommend you have something in there because suggesting cost is weird, you know. So that's just me. Um, anyway, sorry I missed that right away, but um, try to keep an eye on those. Um, let's see if we can leave that open and still still get our job done at the same time. Um, all right, yeah, that's weird. All right, we'll do that and see if that works. All right, so um, anyway, so um, so anyway, you guys can see that that that's a that's a style that's a style that more than one item. The, the font turns blue, right? Everybody gets that. So um, if I wanted to build an item, I would just click new right here and it would flip into a, well, that's not the screen I want, but that's more like the screen I want. This screen here is designed at 1024 by 768 resolution. I'm running a lot higher resolution. So if I was actually gonna work on this size monitor permanently, I would raise the font on all these fields. I would make this whole screen bigger, a lot easier to see, a lot easier to work on. All that's options, and we're not really talking about design tools today. That's not in our webinar, but I will say that, you know, we could move anything we want. We could resize any size font we want. You know, if we wanted to blow something up and make it a lot bigger, we could, we could do all that, right? So that being said, we're just going to go ahead and no, don't save that, put it back the way it was. All right, so um, we click new, some basics here. Um, a department code is required, period, exclamation point. A department code is required. If you don't put a department code on, you can't save the item, do not pass go or collect 200 bucks, basically. Um, vendor code is not required, vendor code is optional. Um, we would typically recommend defining the style number in one of these fields and the description in the other, um, which is pretty common actually. Uh, so you see here in this example, we've got a style number in description two and we've got a name in description one. Now in preferences, and this is not a training on preferences either, but in preferences we can define, we can choose which of those fields is the style definition, if that makes sense. So. Um, a style definition, let's say that this KM4567 here is a style number. A style number could be used by more than one vendor, right? So that's not enough 
of a style definition by itself, it, it's rare that two vendors use the same style number though, so it's pretty close. Anyway, a full style definition would be the department the item comes from, the vendor it belongs to, and the style definition is defined in system preferences. And if items meet all of those criteria, then they become a style. So here you see these things have the same department, same vendor, same style number. And if that's true, they must have a unique combination of color and size, attribute and size. So they can have the same color as long as their size is different, or they could have the same size, right, as long as their color was different. That's the rules for style definition. Now, if I'm copying an item, um, if I were to put like these these items into the system, um, it would tell me the style already exists. So if I take this one here, let's see, I don't even know what my definition is. Let's go look. Options, system preferences, local, uh, merchandise, general. Description one is my definition. Okay, fine. So let's get out of here. And I, it's your choice what you use for a style definition, but I usually would, would go with the, the style number because it's really easy to get a style number right. It's really hard to make a typo when you're given a number and that's the number you have to put in. Uh, here, if I abbreviated this in any way or changed the spacing on that, it would cause us to not, to, to not, it would not recognize that this is a style, right? That's it, right? So if I say, um, if I go new here and I say WB, what was that? It was um, like, oh yeah, WB. And of course, I'm going to cheat. Right, so if I type these in exactly the same way and click save, it says, hey, this style already exists. So if you're putting this in fresh and the style does not exist, then that's kind of a big red flag that maybe you're making a mistake and maybe you should cancel that and back up and go search to make sure that you're not putting a style in twice. And if you are not putting a style in twice, then you're not defining it well enough. Bottom line, right? Now, I'm going to cancel this real quick. I'm going to go ahead and, and do this here. We're going to say blue slash gray. And that's just like that. And then we're going to say seven. Okay, now I've really gone in deep now, right? Not only have I put the same style in, but I put the same color and size in. Right now, I'm going to click save and see what happens. And it says, "Warning: Will Robinson danger? Um, you've put the same item in duplicate attribute for whatever reason. When it thinks about fields, it thinks about department, vendor, description one, uh, size, then attributes. So attributes like the last level, shall we say? Right. So it just says duplicate attributes, which for me is not the best error message. You're actually putting You've duplicated the item in its entirety now. So there is no, uh, do you want to continue, right? There's no, yes, I'd like to save this. It's like you screwed up, okay, that's it, stop, do not pass go, right? That's it. So here we can't save this now unless we change this size to a different size. Now, also notice that I did not put the style number in, but the style number is not part of the style definition, so it doesn't matter what I put there, does it? That makes sense to everybody. Now, the style definition is amazingly important. It doesn't matter if you actually sell styles or not. Understanding what defines the item and what, what, what the prompt is when it says join style is incredibly important if you're not going to make stupid mistakes. So, um, don't want to get back on the soapbox. I'm going to get off the train right there. I want to go ahead and, and, and not save that. So. Um, basic inventory. If I'm going to put a new item in, I would click new. It would take me to my input screen. I would put in the fields. I would click save. I would have an item. Okay. Cancel that. If I'm going to put a style in, I would go to style view. And this is style view. And in style view, 
the things on the top of the grid, anytime, thank you. The things on the top of the grid here, uh, form view, I like form view better, um, are shared by all members, right? And then the grid itself shows the size on the left here, and the color on the left, and the size across the top, right? And there are, are there items that, there are sizes that don't come in every color, like apparently we have a size 17 navy, but, but size 17 doesn't come in mushroom. Probably a good thing, actually. Um, not sure why we'd have a size 17 handbag anyway, but again, this is just demo data that just kind of gets trashed up. So let's not, let's not analyze it too deeply because it'll scare us. Um, so this is a grid. This is a star grid and everything up here is shared. Everything in the top is written. So if I change the price here, if I change this price to 450, and I save that, that will change the price on every single item in the grid. So that's the, the KM45 thing. I'm going to go back to item view, KM456. What do we got going here for price? Yeah, 450 right there, right? Boom. And if we go back to list view and we take a look at the Okay, so let's cheat here. Let's go ahead and copy this and let's just drop that into our filter at the top, right? We'll control Victor here. And uh, well, that's kind of weird. Oh, maybe not. That's kind of a good thing to see. But they're both 450, right? But why am I only seeing two? Seems kind of weird. That's very weird. Well, ours is not to, to question why right now. I suspect I could find out what's wrong with that style, but I'm not going to troubleshoot it while you guys are on a webinar. We're here to learn stuff. I can fix my data later, right? So um, so what I want to make sure we understand is some basics here. If I was going to build a new style, and I'm actually trying to get to a point here. There's a mistake, a common mistake that everybody makes. So let's just start with the basics here. If I was going to build a new style, I would go to style view first, I cannot emphasize that enough to go to style view first. Then you would, you would pick your department. So we might say uh, it's it's a men's item. Let's see what we got in, in, in the men's department. So it's a, we got a lot of shoes in here, don't we? Well, all right, I guess men's jacket, ski. All right, whatever. Um, we would then pick a vendor of some kind. Um, I'm just going to type in uh, Nike, I think, is in there. Yep, all right. We put our description in, uh, whatever we wanted it to be, trying to be consistent, put our style number in there. Um, right, boom, boom, boom. Pick a scale. So a scale is something that lets us uh, predefine a set of sizes and or colors, mostly sizes. So let's say uh, jacket extra small through extra large and this scale happens to have color I would not normally have color in there um, let's see if I can find a one without color because actually you typically wouldn't have color in a um, let's just do that all right well this one's got color too all right close enough um, now you see that this this one here has SML as the size definition but the last one had S so I would I would strongly recommend that we when you you use scales you predefine your values that promotes consistency so when we're using the scale we're getting the same version whether it's SML SML SMALL just S I don't care just make it be the same for all items right don't don't squirrel around back and forth because that'll just lead to messes in your data data consistency is extremely hard so all right, we, we, we put a def definition in, we put a cost in, let's say it costs, I don't know, costs us 45, and we sell it for, that says 90, but I'm going to say 99.99. Again, I'm the human being, I get to decide the price, right? The suggestion is just a suggestion, that's all it is. And we could have it be rounded, too, but we're not here to talk about preferences. All right, let's say that it comes in 
Uh, maybe it comes in a wide navy, maybe it doesn't. Let's say I want to put some colors in. I could click edit attribute and size, and I could add some colors here, right? So I could say it comes in black, and it comes in green. All right, beautiful. So I'm going to click OK. Then uh, starting on the left side here, I would move across left to right, defining uh, the grid points with quantities like this. Now I'm directly in inventory. In a minute, we'll be on a purchase order. And in the purchase order, these would be order quantities in inventory. Unless you're editing the quantities directly into inventory, they would not be real quantities. They'd just be zeros. So what that's doing, though, is that's building the SKUs, right? So if I hit save now, I'll let it write some data. Nice. That is not the item. There's some settings that are wrong in here. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say. So, um, item view. I don't know. I'll play with things while we're while we're going here. Filtered view. So there's two um, <coughs> filtering mechanisms. You saw me use the, the quick filter earlier on the top, right? Um, I'm gonna pop in here to the filtered view, which is far more powerful than the um, the quick filter. I'm going to go ahead and add a field called created date. I'm going to type T enter, T enter to put in today, T is today. I'm just going to go look and see if we can find things that I made today, right? Well, that's kind of weird. But it did exactly what I asked, right? It created black in small, medium, large, XL, 2X, 3X. I would I would have done it just a single S and I would have used two XL, three XL instead of XXL, but it doesn't really matter, right? You do it how you want to do it and you make sure it's consistent through all your data, right? So it built all those SKUs for me. Okay. That's the proper way to build a style. Go to style view, click new, define style, quick save. Again, not rocket science. Now, what is the problem? And why am I making such a big deal of this? Like, really, Jeff, get get it together. What I, I I have a problem with is is when people click new, and they start building an item right here. So they say this is a men's jacket or whatever, right? Uh, and they say um, a vendor coat of whatever, and they get down to description style, and then they get to size and go, oh gosh, this is a style. And then they just go over here and click on style view, which is a problem. So uh, when that when that occurs, by the way, what what happens is um, it creates that item. It saves that that item preliminarily. So we got a little one of our participants is taken off. And uh, I appreciate the comments. Thank you very much. You have a good day. So um, anyway, um, it, it creates an orphaned item. That's literally what happens. So um, don't do this. Don't get halfway through. If you're halfway through and you are realizing that you're going to need more than one member, you have one of two options. Finish it or, or abandon it, right? I don't care. So if you know that this is going to be a small and it's going to be red, then put small red in there, put the cost, put the price in, finish it all the way down, then click save or click cancel and go to style view, right? That's the deal. So um, one way or the other, though, don't, don't get halfway through because what you'll get is you'll get the whole style defined with small through 3X in two colors and one extra item with no size and no color. So don't do that. If you're building an item, build an item. If you're building a style, build a style. Go to the appropriate section and do what do what do what you're trying to do. That that's pretty much it. Okay, so let's talk about some um, other features here. So there's a few uh, features we've got called out in my little sheet on the left here. We'll see if I've got all the stuff I need to show you them. Um, Non-inventory. That's this field right here. So non-inventory means I can check this off, and if I check it off, the quantity never changes. So if I sell a service for waxing skis, if I sell a gift wrap, if I sell 
a bag in San Francisco for 25 cents because I have to by by the local state regulation or county or city, whatever, uh, then I don't really want to receive those bags. I just want to sell the heck out of them and I want them to be zero on hand all the time. Thus, the switch non-inventory. That's what it does. So you can't activate this. If you've got quantity on hand, it will not let you turn this on. So, um, all right, price levels. Let's talk about price levels. Cancel. Stop. Thank you. Form view. Price levels. Here's a price level for retail. If I come down here, if I wanted to, I have other price levels I'm guessing to find. Yeah, they've got all kinds of junk in here. Um, right, so we have a member price that's uh, $89.99, right, or something like that. Uh, so you can have different price levels, and you can do different things with different price levels. Price levels can be for discounting. Price levels can be for tracking. Like, so I could have an MSRP or an original price level. And then if I'm taking markdowns, and I got some stuff on markdown for 10%, and I want to take them you know, to 20%, I wouldn't take them 20% off, 10% off. I would take them 20% off the original price. But if I'm going to do that, i got to have the original price saved someplace like a price level, if that makes any sense. So mostly when I'm talking about price levels, i got to tell you, I... I don't want to do a lot of maintenance on, on price levels. I prefer price levels that are really easy to maintain. And by that, I mean um, original price. I don't think it gets easier. Like if I'm going to type two prices in and one of them is original, I mean, you type the original in, you're done with it pretty much forever. Because the whole point of original is to know what the original price was. So unless you're raising the price, you're not going to change the original. All the markdowns would just go on retail, if that makes sense. Um, if you do a member and the member is 10% off of retail, then you're going to be using what's called the price manager. And the price manager would let us, uh, okay, we don't care. All right, list. Uh, the price manager is a tool we have right here in inventory where we could take an adjustment from retail uh, by subtracting a percentage of 10, right? I could click adjust and it would save it into the markdown column and then I could update it and overwrite member as being 10% off retail, right? So, but that's going to have to be done over and over again because items change price, new items get introduced, they don't have the membership level, right? Blah, blah, blah. So that's a big conversation. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do with price levels. Price levels can be attached to stores. Price levels can be attached to customers, right? So we could have a, like at least the case of a membership customer, right? We could actually go out and say that the price level of this person is using is member. I mean, price levels are cool. I'm just going to tell you. But they've got too many of them. They end up being a lot of work. So just be careful about how you set those things up. Uh, Multi-vendor, excellent feature. And let's pop out of customers and go look at multi-vendor. So um, let's take a quick look here. Options. System preferences, um, purchasing general. Okay, restrict to one vendor per PO and receiving documents. Let's go look at an item. Let's see here. Dun, 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 dun. So what do we got here? We got uh, vendor VIB. If I go to form view, and we see that there's a multi-vendor box here, right? So if I add to this NIKE, right? And I hit save. Uh, I guess I should look at that one of these days, huh? Um, we don't have an ALU. We're going to put an ALU on this. Hopefully that one's not in use. All right. There's a plugin in here that's, that's maintaining the price levels that I should have probably in uninstall. Um, all right. So. So I've got this thing here. I've got a primary vendor of this VIV. I've got a secondary vendor of NIKE, right? So I put an ALU of one 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 six ones. And if I go out and I say purchasing purchase order new, and I say VIV, a couple things happen. If I go to choose edit items, 
and look in inventory. Wow, I don't see anything at all. That's kind of odd. Huh. Try this again. Wow. All right, excellent. Seems like I'm failing here on my setup for this webinar, huh? Options, system preferences, documents, general. ALU is defined as a field. Okay. Let's see what happens if I go the other way. Well, at least half is working. Anyway, um, you see here that uh, it has limited all my items to, it is pre-filtered to that vendor. Right, I'm not sure why the VIV is not working, and I don't want to take time troubleshooting something in in uh, in a webinar. We need to keep on topic here, but um, of course, I'd love to figure out what's wrong with that too. But um, that item would be eligible. It would show in both menus, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's just not working at all, is it? Did it not save? Maybe it didn't. I don't know. Yeah, it's right there, right? Yeah, it's pretty weird. All right, nobody's asleep yet, are they? Yeah, no, this is crash data. I agree, uh, Ian. Uh, th th there are a lot of items with no ALUs, and, and it's it's embarrassing. Um, I got this sales data from um, from one of our sales reps, and they will remain nameless for now. And um, Okay, the vendor for the item selected does not match the vendor, so that's 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 like an error. So it did find the item, but it's not letting me grab that item for some reason. Um, but like I said, I don't want to spend too much more time on this because it's starting to get a little a little embarrassing. Uh, the the thing is, I like restrict vendor. Restrict vendor really rocks. It's a sweet feature, and what we should be able to do here, and I don't know why it's not working for me, is is we should be able to to assign more than one vendor to a given item. Oh, I know why. <laughs> Okay, so let's see how many people out there are really on it today. Um, why is that item not working? It's on the screen, clear as day. Just eluded me for about five minutes. Okay, I'm just gonna reach up here and click activate the item. Okay, so the item was an inactive item all along, so. <laughs> Kind of good though to make that kind of mistake and have everybody see that, you know, because <laughs> hey, that's that's true actually. So let's go out and try this again. Let's see here, new. Let's try VIV. Yeah, I don't know what VIV is, but let's find out. Let's go choose edit items, and there is the item, both the one 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 and my wacky UPC code, right? And if I go back out now and say no, nope, let's make this Nike. Of course, it'll work now, right? So if I put in one 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 one, it says okay. This now it's fine. It's happy as a clam. Now I can do it. So um, there you go. And I fixed the problem. Amazing, huh? Um, all right. So restrict vendor, but multi vendor gives you the ability to to get that pre filtering so when you start to write a PO or a receiving voucher. And you put a vendor on the top of that document, and you have to go select them. You don't have to start in the entire ocean of inventory. You can start at least in that vendor's products. And you're probably going to have to do secondary filtering, but you know we might as well start at step two rather than at step one. Um, but you may also buy that item from more than one person, especially if you buy things from distributors. And that item, like pet food, you can go to Animal Supply, you can go to Central Pet. You know, there's just a whole bunch of big distributors out there that sell the exact same product. Right, so in the multi-vendor box, just in case you didn't notice it, 
uh, has a, a place to put the order cost for the other vendor. I skipped it, but you could have a different order cost for this vendor than you do for that vendor. It could be totally different order cost. Uh, side note, you don't have to use these, but you can use these, and you could use these all by themselves. Meaning, if I had an item in inventory that was just an item that said assorted sunglasses, and I just got these sunglasses assorted from the vendor, if they didn't sell, the vendor took them back, and then every month the vendor brings over new new ones, and I just add the UPC codes to the list, and I just sell them all out. That's actually real. Actually, that was a situation that, that I had to address on site at uh, Niagara Falls. So um, they actually sold assorted sunglasses, and the vendor would bring in different UPC codes, and they would just add the UPC code to the list. Boom, add this one, and then add another one. And you could then, okay, that one's duplicate. Eh, next contestant. Uh, nice try there, huh? Oh, man. This is pretty, it knows all my tricks, doesn't it? Not all of them, apparently. So, anyway, now we could use any one of these, right? I could use this one or the one on the bottom or or the 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 one that's on the native record or the ALU, any of those would sell the same item over and over again. So pretty handy though if you if you don't have to track the individual items and you just want to sell them out generically and not worry about it, then uh, it's a really sweet little trick. Okay, so the next thing we're supposed to look at is serial number lot number. So um, that's an odd one. Um, so in inventory. Um, In the top of our, our uh, item detail box, you know, and our sales rep puts all these weird pictures in here. I have to apologize for that. Um, up here, you can you can um, you can change the serial type right there to be to be full or partial. There's also a lot number field that does the same thing. I don't think it's on the screen, but it works exactly the same way. And it's up to us to to understand this feature, right? Because I don't know that anybody's using it out there. In fact, you wouldn't use serial number tracking unless you were selling handguns or you were legally required to track the serial number. Like in the state of California, you are legally required to track the serial number on bicycles at point of sale, not at point of receiving. So that would be a, a partial track, right? That would not be a full track. And I would not bother at point of receiving capturing those, but I would scan them into the receipt as we sold them, right? So if you do set up a serial number tracking, um, you have to then add the button for serial number tracking to your um, to your menu. Is it already there? Yeah, it is already there. Excellent. So let's just set this to full track and hit save. And our angry message pops up. And it did not change it. So that's interesting because that angry message, I guess, is really angry. Yeah, all right. So you see the serial number button that just lit up right here? So you click the serial number. It accesses that lower table that would hold all those serial numbers. And you could see them. And you could delete them. And you could add some new ones in. And you could manage them right here if you wanted to. So and you could change locations. You can see what's in what location. So. Anyway, that's probably enough on a feature that we're probably not going to, uh, you know, use a great deal, right? Yeah, and and, and Ian's pointing out that it's a it's a real pain in the butt if you're if you miss the serial numbers on those things. Um, to that point, though, Ian, I would add that I could barcode the serial number. So, um, and 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 really. Uh, Ideally, in a perfect world, that they, they, they modified some preferences um, early on, in, like early version nine. This was available, but it is the current version. Uh, you can make the serial number be a lookup code. So I wouldn't even need the item number. I would just print the tag with the serial number, really. So um, you know, yeah, that's pretty cool. Because so then you can scan it; it brings it up, it prompts you for the serial number, and you scan the same barcode, beep beep, twice, and you just you're done. So it simplifies it. It's I'm just going to say it's still a pain in the butt. So 
and I'm not going to go even talk about how to set up lot numbers, but I can give you a quick, like, one minute or 30 seconds on that one. Um, a lot number is a a lot, like a serial number, but 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 for a given item, you would have maybe say three lots. And now those lot numbers were put in there for pharmaceuticals, drugs. So if the drugs expire, you have three batches. One expires tomorrow. One expires in two weeks. One expires in a month. Um, and you sell these things, and there's a legal liability if you sell something that's expired. Then you need to track it, right? If you if you sell an expired loaf of bread, nobody cares. If you sell some painkiller that's expired, you, you could be in legal trouble, right? So that's that's what uh, lot numbers do for us. But again, they're 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 kind of a pain because you have to have tags and you have to use a lot number to to bring the item up. Then it prompts you for the lot number. You have to sell, scan the lot number in. You have to got to put the expiration dates on the lots and it's a little more work. So enough said on that feature. I think we've satisfied our, our outline. Um, so let's talk about count sheets is next on my list to talk about. And now count sheets are just basically doc design tricks. So, so, so here in inventory, if I click print tag, I see surprisingly tag designs, right? And I could print a tag. There's a basic tag, preview, sometime in our lifetime, preferably. Okay, that 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 printer that it's using, I should have switched that out. That was a was a network printer, wasn't it? Yep. All right. So there's a basic tag design. Excellent. We will try and not use that printer again. All right. Now, a doc design. Everybody knows a doc designer exists in Retail Pro. I hope uh, it's a tool, and it's used to to design different things. So. Um, we could, if we wanted to, let's say we wanted to, uh, like, let's say that these, these, uh, solid side tie here, let's say that they're really hard to tag, that we really can't put a tag on them, that they're a problem that way, and we need a way of selling them quickly out of point of sale. It turns out there's more of those than I thought. Um, so I would probably want to organize those. I got, I got nothing to sort on, do I? <laughs> Looks like in color. All right, so um, then we'll go ahead and say um, print tag. And now this is one of our cheat sheets. This is one of our doc design tricks, right? So I'm going to say all listed records preview. I almost did it again, didn't I? Let's switch to something local. All right, so this is a POS cheat sheet. Now, unfortunately, the barcode field is the ALU field, and not all items have an ALU. Therefore, not all items have a barcode, but I think you get where we're going with this, right? You could easily have a cheat sheet at point of sale that would be able to scan out items very quickly. And ideally, if you're using this, you would pick a field, a better field than description one, like an auxiliary one or two or something. And you would mark the items that would be eligible for this kind of thing, right? That's what you'd do. And then you'd be able to filter for them and print those out. While we're here, I'm going to go ahead and click print, count sheet, OK. And all, again, all listed records, you will forget that, by the way. That one is a, a real a real pain in the butt. When you forget it, you just get the top item. It's kind of embarrassing. So this, again, is a, again, a doc design trick, right? I'm just printing out everything that is in that filtered view. And I'm showing me on hand. And um, it's not a preloaded design. Uh, excellent question, um, uh, Ian. Uh, and, but, but we'll gladly give you any and all of these designs. I have them for both version eight and version nine. Uh, would not be a problem. I could, uh, you know, my email is just Jeff K at Big Hairy Dog. So if you want to uh, email me, anybody out there, if you want to email uh, J E F F K at Big Hairy Dog, make sure you tell me what version you're on. I'm hoping you're on nine if you're watching a nine webinar, but you know, if you're on eight, I would need to know that, right? So I could change the right kind of design. So they are not the same, right? But I could just, I could fire back some designs. Would be no no big deal. Uh, so please feel free. Um, so that that one is a nice one. The count sheet is very useful. The pre-count the, the pre sheet is also useful. That's the one next one I want to show you. Um, so one of my ladies up in Langley, British Columbia said, can you design a document 
that I could put on the outside of a box so that I could pre-count the contents of the box prior to physical inventory and be able to just scan the outside of the box without having to count every item in the box. Thus, the pre-count sheet was born. Um, and then, of course, again, we don't have barcodes on everything. That's just bad data is what that is. Um, but ideally, in a perfect world, you'd have your description here. You'd have a, maybe a picture, a uh, barcode. You put your count there on the right. Then you plaster this on the outside of the box. And, and then when you go to count, you just go beep 47, beep 12, beep 1, beep 4, beep. So all this is is can you filter to the item and click print, right? That's all this is. Now, the other thing um, <clears throat> that's really cool on this one that I didn't see coming is that uh, once we started rolling this out to everybody, um, people started using it uh, for seasonal goods. Like they would, they would filter for the items they put in the seasonal goods, like Christmas goods that are boxing, and they're going to be up in the top rafter all year until we bring them out again next season. They want to know what's in the box quickly without opening it. Yeah, this is a perfect method for that too. Anyway, there's a few other things that we have out there. I'm not going to go through all of them. There's a very nice markdown one. This is a multi-store count sheet. So if if you wanted to see what was in all your locations. This lists all the locations as opposed to just one location. So, um, same thing other than that. Do you want to save it? No, I don't. Um, there is also um, this multi ALU print. This this dives down and looks at those alternate um, UPC or ALUs, this, and it only shows items that have that. Very cool, by the way. Um, this one here, picture, I think this one here was used to um, to look at pictures, which I'm not even sure this one works. Cancel. Yeah, no, these don't have pictures, but yeah, all right, so it's showing dead items. But um, one of my clients had a need to know which items had pictures and which ones didn't. He wanted to wait a very quickly determine that. Well, the fastest way is just to splash it up on the screen and the ones that don't don't and the ones that do do right so that was like that was kind of like the um it was a repeating band it would have repeated across left to right too but i didn't let it go that far um and then price lists if you have multiple price lists this 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 uh does it linearly this one here stacks them so um there's just two different versions of the same thing uh depending on how many price levels you have and how many you need to show see this one here put some next to each other but if you have more than like six there they're going to go off the page right uh, so in that case you'd have to go to the other other design and it would move this whole box thing underneath the item and then you could go all the way across the page with it so that's all that is all right so that gives us the basics on inventory as, as defined by my my uh, outline here so the next thing we would be doing is looking at um, purchase orders and then receiving vouchers and then some um, and some clean house and some maintenance. That would be the whole list there. Uh, and again, feel free to ask questions as we go. But uh, let's pop out to the main menu. Let's talk about. Uh, let's pop into the system preferences for a quick second on this purchase order thing. There is a feature in here that um, that gets bypassed a lot. That's kind of cool. So we should just peek at it real quick. So I'm just going to turn on this auto generate PO number. It's in uh, system preferences, local document sequences. And uh, you turn this on and decide how you want to do it. So if I say I want the PO number to have the vendor code, then I would like to have the PO number have the date, and then I would like to have it be followed by having a sequential number. By the way, you have to have a sequential number. That's not optional to take out. Anyway, so when we go into purchasing, purchase orders, and I say new, and I say like VIV here, let's we'll stick on that because can be pretty easy we all know we know that there's only one item out there right so choose edit items and there's our only item and so we go ahead and say we want 50 of those because then that's going to be a good seller and we bring that back here to the purchase order and we click save when we click save it generates the PO number of VIV 0613 and 001440 so that last six digits is the sequential number obviously the the 061319, that's June 13th of 19 or 2019.
1919 nice. Might be a little old then if that's the case. Um, anyway, that's that's that feature there. So uh, anyway, in the PO, if we were building this PO, let's let's walk through the things. Obviously, PO number generates at the end. The end code we put in. PO type dropship versus mark for. So that there, um, actually not a bad PO. We can play with this PO with that. Um, dropship is a bad phrase, but in this case, dropship means to the store, not to the customer. Okay, marked for means that. On this PO, some of the quantity here is marked for other locations, other stores, but vendor, disregard that, just send it to me. I'll handle my own distribution, right? So in a marked for PO, you can allocate. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we go over here to the sidebar menu, it says it's allocation pattern and item allocation. So if I pop into item allocation for a second, I can see that there's 50 going into this location. I can say I want 10 here, I want 10 here, 10, 10, 10. Okay, so now if I go OK, it still says 50 there, doesn't it? So from the vendor's point of view, I'm just ordering 50. But I can now have a, a distribution plan that I can generate out to a transfer order. And when this thing hits, It'll warn the receiver there's a transfer order. They can use the transfer order to transfer the product to the other location. So um, real quick here, allocation pattern versus item allocation. Uh, we got one item on here, right? So that's not terribly terribly exciting. What if we do MIKE here? Switch it up. This item is eligible for both. Woohoo. We go out to choose edit items, right? And we say uh, whatever, 100. Uh, 200, 300, 400. Okay, I think we got the idea here. So let's say that I would need to allocate all those items. I could do it one at a time, or I could have what's called an allocation pattern. Right, so here's an allocation pattern right here, right? It says that the store two here is a lot bigger than this store here. It's seven times bigger. So these are relationships. This is twice as big as this, right? This is seven times bigger than that, right? It's not seven times bigger than this. Certainly not seven times bigger than this down here, four, right? So if I say apply pattern, then I click back in here and go to item allocation. You see it used those ratios to divide up the allocation and assign numbers. So typically if you're actually allocating a PO, you'd do both. You'd use an allocation pattern for that rough initial layer right, and get the basic allocation done. And many items would be probably fine with that. I mean, you got an A size store and a B size store and a C size store or any way you want to measure it, then you're going to send more product to the A store than you are to the C store, right? It's not rocket science here, right? So the basic allocation probably is fine for most products. However, there may be special items in there that the C store really does better with. We would have to go and massage the allocation on those, right? Anyway, if you do that, um, then you click Save. Uh, you would then be able to do this Generate Transfer Order, in which case you would not choose Distributed. You would not choose Undistributed. You would choose Marked For. Distributed just puts the order quantity of, say, 400 on the on the TO, but it doesn't distribute it. Kind of a bad name. Undistributed puts the item on there with no quantity. Marked For puts the the 400 and all the distributed quantities to all locations on the TO. So if you use this feature, you definitely use Mark 4, and it builds the TO for you, which we'll circle back to the TO in a bit. So, okay. Um, now, so far, what I've done is I've built a PO. I did not address the date fields. Let's get those out of the way real quick. So we've got the order date. That's today, the ship date. Um, ship dates, you can change the date by clicking the drop down menu and picking a day, right? You can change this here and go forward a month or backward a month. We all know that. But if I want to go right to December, I could click on June and go right to December. And we all knew that, right? And go right to any month I want or any year I want, right? We also, so let's say we pick a date here. Uh, we could also click into here and type T. T is today, right? T 
plus, 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 plus. I don't know if you noticed, but every time I hit plus, it changes that month. So I started on six. I've hit it four times. I'm on 10, 13 of 2019, right? So I can move around in this field. And if I'm on the day and I hit the plus sign, it goes up. If I hit the minus sign, it goes down. I'm hitting the plus and minus key on the numeric keypad, not the one above the letters. All right, so um, then I went to choose edit items, and in choose edit items, it let me find the items. I could filter for do additional filtering either here or here. Find the items I want. I use the document quantity, and in the document quantity field, I put how many I want to buy, and I can say how much I'm going to pay for them. I'm going to pay uh, fifteen seventy-five for these, right? And I could change the price, kind of unusual, but you could. And it brings that new cost back to the PO, right? So the document columns are exactly that. They're columns that are for the document, right? Now, um, this button says uh, choose edit items, doesn't it? That means if I was out here and I said, yeah, this is cool, but I need this to be in the 4X, I could go ahead and say copy. And I could say make this one a 4XL. And I could say pink, pink. I just noticed it's hot pink, right? Uh, and it would then create that. And now here's the order quantity down here, but I can't get to the order quantity field. Why can't I get to the order quantity field? Because I just copied it and I haven't saved it yet. You can't order something that doesn't exist. So a little argument takes place here between Retail Pro and Oracle, the database, right in the background. Oracle is not going to let you put this on the PO until you click save. Once you click save, and it's a happy little clam, and it gives you those errors, it'll let you order it. Right now, I can come down here and say I want uh, uh, 24 of these. Right? Boom. So I just added an item to the database on the fly, 4XL, hot pink, USRT, whatever. I didn't make that up. Um, or if I wanted to, I could go to style view, click new, and I could build a whole style right here, which we probably should do actually, at least start it so we can get the idea. So the difference here is that I'm on a PO, first and foremost, I'm on a PO. I'm also in inventory, right? So I would come out here and click new. And when I click new, it's going to give me a grid, hopefully sometime soon. Oh, it's really angry at me, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, all right, we're probably done on this one. It's really angry. I might have been moving too fast, or I might have done something a little bit too cool with the uh, screens here on this, this setup. Uh, yeah, all right. Sorry, guys, I was on, really on a roll there, too. I was, like, excited, as is usually the case, and I go a little too fast, and I push a little too hard. I think there's a problem with the screen design. So what I'm trying to get to is that all the rules of editing inventory that we went over earlier, how a style is defined, right? How the attributes and sizes are defined, they are exactly the same. The only difference when you're in choose edit items is the quantity is going on the PO, right? That's the difference. So in a style view through a PO, we would put in the order quantities. That's that's the exciting piece that I really wanted to share, but um, sort of fell on my face there on my way in, I guess, right? So um, choose edit items. Can I even do that? Or is it going to blow up again? Let's see, pick one of these. Let's go to style view. And is it going to blow up on me again? Probably is. Blows up twice. We're not we're not coming back a third time. I will then go get that fixed. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely a bad or something wrong with my screen design. Now, since we hit this right, and uh, what do you do if this happens, right? It, you kill kill Retail Pro, obviously. Um, but but that's something that our tech force could fix, and, and or I could fix. I just don't want to do it now while I'm on the phone with you, uh, taking time to do troubleshooting on that is is kind of dumb. Um, but that is just a, a screen. There's something wrong with the way the screen was designed, and it's not letting us um, get to that screen. 
if I were to swap that out, I could probably fix that pretty quick. All right, so so we can order, or I should say reorder existing items, or we can create new items on the fly. And to be honest, most uh, most items are created during the purchase order process. Like who wants to go out and build a bunch of items, then go to a PO and have to recall those items back up again, right? Why not just do both at the same time, right? All right. Um, a PO, let's talk about a PO real quick and then we'll move on to vouchers. But in PO land, um, this is a trick question. So when does a purchase order affect inventory, right? The trick answer is never. Only receiving vouchers affect inventory, right? So a PO is not carved in stone. It can be edited at any time. The items can be taken off, right? So um, POs could be left open forever. You could receive against the same PO every day. I have clients that do that. Rare, but if you're a if you're a uh, like a little gift shop that has a little bit of snacks and a, little, and a little bit of dairy, and every day they make deliveries for your milk. Like, I'm not gonna write a fresh PO every day. I got 24 dairy items. I'm gonna put them on one PO and receive against that PO every day, all year. I don't really care what happens to the PO. It's just about the receiving, isn't it? So, all right, so you can edit these, you can delete these, and in fact, it is your responsibility to delete these. Once they're done, once we're not going to use them anymore, you would inactivate them. We're going to use this for our next phase, so we're not going to inactivate that now. That would be foolish. We could be getting ahead of ourselves. All right, so then, receiving vouchers. Uh, there's a couple ways we can go on this one, actually. Um, I'm going to pop back to this, this um, PO again real fast, and I'm going to click um, Generate ASN. Anybody know what ASN stands for? ASN stands for Advanced Shipping Notice, right? ASNs are have been used in the past in uh, what's called EDI, Electronic Data Interchange. Uh, that's when we have an EDI function installed in Retail Pro that can send electronically send the PO directly to the vendor without printing it and faxing it or emailing it and giving it to the rep. It just goes into their, their, their software, right? We have a kind of a, there's an EDI integrator typically. We, we send it up to the EDI integrator. They send it down to the vendor. The vendor sends it back in advanced shipping notice. That comes back into our system and we see it. In this case here, we're looking at possibly generating our own, right? So this is one of two avenues to receive. I'm going to click yes and click OK. We're going to go talk about some basic receiving first. So let's go into purchasing a voucher, right? And then we would go new, and we would go find our PO, right? And if we had it, we could have typed it in. I'm just going to click OK and reference it. When I when I click OK, of course, it puts the vendor in and does not fill the items in because it doesn't know which of the items came in, right? Because vendors always ship exactly what we order, right, every time. Um, so. We got two set of items, but we don't want that. We want PO items. We want to go look at the PO, and on the PO, we can now say, "Yeah, I got 50 of those. Woohoo! Yeah, I got 100 of those. Woohoo!" Or I could come over here to the sidebar menu and say, "Look, receive due. Like fill the whole column in, except I only got 150 of those. We got short shipped on those, right? That would be the faster way to get this done, right? So receive due, and then edit as needed." And then OK and bring those back to the to the uh, receiving voucher, right? So in receiving, I, I think we can all agree that there are three basic pieces to this process. OK? And that would be order, receive, and reconcile, right? Reconciliation takes place in accounting. We're not going to go deeply into that. But suffice to say, if I had an invoice at point of receiving, I could do steps two and three at the same time, saving myself a lot of headache. So, you know, just FYI, if you have an invoice, you can balance this, right? You could make sure it worked. Like, here's my piece count. Piece count should, should match because, damn, you just counted these in. So 
it should match, right? But um, if this doesn't match, it's because one of these costs up here is wrong. They've interchanged the cost of putting you for 10 cents more than they said they would. And maybe they, we can hold their feet to the fire, maybe we can't, right? So, But that's typically where the error is. If you have a problem finding the error, put the thing on hold, go to the held menu, print the thing out. Oh, that's a terrible design. It's embarrassing what that is. Oh, yeah, we used the wrong printer again, didn't we? All right, fine, whatever. So uh, the point is if you had a hard copy in your hand, you could sit down against the packing slip. You could then cross off the ones that match, right? Whatever you're left with then is the one that's that's wrong, if you see where I'm going. Then when you, once you know the answer, you go back in your held menu here. You highlight the transaction that we're worried about. We click edit here. Sometimes the unhold button is not here. Don't worry. The edit button puts you back in edit mode, puts it back in active. Boom, good, rock and roll, continue, right? Okay, so that's your basic receiving. Now, once these things here balanced, if they did balance, you'd then be responsible for making this one balance, which would be adding freight or discounts up here. And once all that balances, the invoice number would go in. Which, you, if you don't have an invoice, you can't put the invoice number in, right? So, all right. So, how does that compare to an ASN? I don't know. How does it differ to the ASN? So, in an ASN situation. The way we could take advantage of that would be that we write a PO, we go beat the vendor up and say, look, dude, you got to send me a PO confirmation. You got to tell me what you're going to ship and any cost changes up front. What a novel concept that would be. And then once you got that PO confirmation, you could go back to your PO and you could modify the costs on the PO, right? You could pre-reconcile this thing. You could reconcile it upstream. A lot of advantages to that. It saves a lot of pain and labor downstream, and it really, really, really helps your cost of goods sold. Because when you receive 100, you sell five, then you reconcile your voucher and you fix the other 95. The five that left, they left at the wrong cost of goods sold. The cost of goods sold is tainted forever. We don't want to have that conversation. All right, so um, if you had an ASN, like waiting for it, and it was pre-reconciled, then the receiving clerk would just go into ASN vouchers. They would see the PO number that they have in question. They would say, generate voucher on the sidebar menu, and it would fill the whole thing in for them, and hopefully balance. Now, I turned off my, my quantities, didn't I? Yeah, I did. I forgot I was working with another client and turned those off. There's an option in, in transfers to make them scan the products in, right? So the switch right now is turned off. If it had been turned on, it would have would have pushed over like this. It would have pushed all these quantities in for me. And so mostly I would lean in this direction here. I would lean with having the quantities fix in, pop in for you. For me, it's about productivity. Like if you have somebody who's going to cheat, they're just going to type the quantities in anyway. So why don't I just put the quantities in for them? It's up to them to verify that the product actually came in, right? Not to be a key punch person. And if they have a problem with cheating, then you got to fire them and you got to get somebody who can do the damn job, right? And that's really what it comes down to. So anyway, um, there is an option to turn this off if you really feel like you don't trust people and you want them to scan it in. And if they scan them in, like, for instance, if I did this right here, we did this here, we said 000619 and 000619. Now, we got uh, 300 of those right there, and we got two more here. So we all know that there's 302 there, right? But it'd be nice if we could just say, click the consolidate items button over here and just have it say 302, wouldn't it? So if you're having them scan in the product because you don't trust them, they would scan it all in and click consolidate and it would bring it back down just so you could see, like, we, we ordered, uh, you know, how many we ordered, how many we got, that kind of thing. Anyway, that's the difference between an ASN and a regular receiving transaction, right? The ASN is, is a tool we would use as buyers to pre-reconcile that and front load it for receiving and thus save ourselves a lot of work downstream when we're reconciling this. We don't have to reverse the voucher and make the copy it and make corrections and all that rigmarole that goes into reconciliation. So, um, so we, um, 
we made a receiving voucher and and we did through an ASN, but it's still referencing a PO. And then we would update or print update. Either one, I'm going to update only. I don't want to print this again. That was so embarrassing. Okay, we, one of these uh, items is turned on for, the, for lot numbers. Excellent. So that's what happens when you have serial number or a lot number turned on. It, it pops up a, a dialog that says, um, you know, okay, all right, well, we're not going to waste any more time on that. I don't really need to update this to that bad. Um, okay, so obviously we all know that we can receive on a receiving voucher without a PO. Now, this is a preference. So I will warn you that in preferences, I could force you to use a PO. But the reality is um, there are many situations in retail where I just need to receive something in real quick. I just drop the the vendor code on my receiver, I go to choose edit items, I find the item I'm looking for, pick on the same item because I know it's easy, and then I go okay, and I, maybe I'm done for a moment, and I update, right? Nice. Uh, modify inventory price. Does anybody ever see that one before? So what happens when we see modify inventory price? We cancel, we look up at our screen, we make sure that our screen has both things on there. Interesting that this one doesn't. Uh, what I'm kind of confused at here is that this has a, an inventory price of 15 and a voucher price of 15. So typically you would review this and you would make the appropriate decision, um, which is kind of the point that I was trying to get to. Again, this data doesn't make a whole lot of sense for what I'm seeing, um, but okay. Uh, I'm going to click print update and click uh, yes. I'm going to I'm going to live dangerously here and cancel. Don't need to see the print job, but thank you for asking. All right, so we can receive with a PO. We can receive without a PO. Right? Fixing mistakes, freight and cost. Right? So you know if this voucher or any one of these vouchers. Right? Uh, let's not mess with uh, those. Let's go here and say form view. Um, if this voucher here had a incorrect cost, right, I would need to fix it in receiving history and I would need to fix it in inventory simultaneously. Like, so that's what I meant earlier about the reconciliation. Um, there is such a thing as, as freight and spreading freight. So let's talk about a few of those things here real quick and how they affect us. So if I go up here and say that there is a, a $20 charge for freight, and what the heck did I just do? Not a valid number, yep. Okay, cancel. Yeah, we get that. All right, fine, whatever. Well, I mean, we're we're having a rock and roll day today, aren't we? That's three times. I think that's the record. Don't even know what I clicked there. I looked away for a second. A little message popped up on the side there. I was reading the message and uh, fell on my face. All right, so with spreading freight, I'm going to warn you guys up front. It's it's a really really appealing function. It's very very seductive. I like it. I'm not going to lie. I mean, who wouldn't? Um, but I am going to warn you that that you got to do things apples to apples with accounting. Okay, period, exclamation point. Right. So if we have an item here and we have a freight charge, let's try this again. Two zero. Okay, it works fine. And we say spread the freight. So the right now the cost is five dollars, and I say spread the cost of freight over the items. It changed it to five dollars and forty cents. So it spread that twenty dollars over those fifty items, if that makes sense. I could go back down to spread cost and I could unspread it. Okay. Now let's talk about this. Let's make sure we understand it, right? Because that's the biggie. Um, okay, so first off, we got accounting over here. 
I mean, we got a retail pro, right? If if accounting has has a freight account and freight goes in the freight account, we don't spread it. It passes directly to accounting in the freight account. End of conversation. Okay. If they do not have a freight account, then freight is considered cost of goods sold, in which case we have to spread freight. Okay. Now, if we have a receiving document, this is my voucher, and it has items on it, but I don't have an invoice, so I don't know the freight, and I receive it into inventory, right? Then it becomes a history document. You guys with me so far? Okay. Then I get an invoice. I must now reverse void this, copy it back over to the other side, and reprocess it through spreading freight. Otherwise, I do not affect the cost of goods in inventory. Not only that, as we already found out earlier, all the items that sold prior to reconciliation sold at the wrong cost. So it increases your reconciliation workload to spread freight. And so as seductive as a number as it is, as cool as this has landed cost, I'm reluctant to recommend it, I got to tell you. Um, it's a lot more work. Um, and I don't think that we always have the option to make the choice in that whatever accounting is doing, if we're not doing the same thing as accounting, by the end of the year, we're going to be like way off, like not even close, right? So you got to, you got to be dotting the I's, crossing the T's on matching accounting, period. Um, when we have variances in our retail pro versus accounting, it's not because there's some big smoking cannon out there, right? It's all the mistakes and all the vouchers and all the point of sale transactions and any transfers that we did all year, right? It's all these little tiny mistakes. That's why they're so hard to find. So with receiving, every receiving has to match the invoice exactly. It has to get reconciled, period. I know. Tell you how I really feel, right? Anyway. Right, so just FYI in here, uh, there's multiple fields in this discount freight box. There are multiple fields in the spread option. I could spread all these. So it may be that we have a freight account and we don't spread freight, but maybe we got this weird fee that we got to pay one time and we just want to spread it over the items and just absorb it into the cost of goods. Totally, totally acceptable. As long as we're on the same page, with accounting, the accounting doesn't want to do anything with that fee. They just want it to be part of the cost of goods. That's the right thing to do, right? Okay, so I think that beats up uh, receiving pretty well. Anybody have any questions? Anybody want to throw any curveballs at me? Um, at least that's as far as my outline goes. What we're supposed to talk about, what we're supposed to talk about next is clean house and how you use it. And, and the importance of keeping your inventory clean, which is uh, actually a pretty good topic. So I would say that we should go do that. So real quick, let's do a compare and contrast between item, like cleaning one item up. Now earlier, we fortunately bumped into this, this VIV item right here that was inactivated, right? So um, that function of inactivating an item is cleaning things up, right? Now in this case, it has an on-hand quantity. If you delete an item, on, if you change the on-hand quantity, it's going to create an audit trail, period, right? Everybody knows that, right? If you change the quantity, your name goes on to an adjustment transaction, right? So uh, click OK. That item then is gone. It's not there anymore, but it's really not gone. If we say show inactive, it comes back, right? And I could then find that item and I could reactivate it. Just like these items here, other members of the same style, we could we could activate them, bring them back from the dead, except we've got a weird plug-in that's continually blowing up, which is hours of endless enjoyment. Um, right, so that's just item by item, like I need to get rid of this item, right? Clean house. Clean house is the big brother to that function. So let's see, let's see what we got here that's exciting. All right, so this item here, this one that we were looking at right here, um, yeah, there's, there's been some squirreling around in here. There should not be an on-hand quantity to an item that's inactive. That's just wrong. But again, we're not going to troubleshoot the database. That's not what we're here for. Um, 
Okay, so uh, this item here, this 111111 item from this vendor VIV, right? If we go out here to merchandise, clean house, and I say find that item, 111111, okay. It's not going to find it because clean house cannot see anything that is not eligible to be inactivated. Those items had a quantity on hand. They're not eligible for clean house. So what makes you eligible for clean house? Having a zero on hand, not negative one, right? A zero in all locations. Not being on a purchase order, not being on a transfer order, not being on a sales order, not being on any order form at all, right? So you, you can't be in play. You can't be in transit either, right? You can't be like sent on, on a transfer halfway to the other store, right? If there is anything pending on the item of any kind, if it's part of a package even, is not eligible for, for clean house. So items that are eligible for clean house are zero on hand old items that are not on in order status right now. So keep your POs clean, inactivate them when you're done, right? You still should probably circle back on that one too. Maybe we'll hit that in a second. All right, so in here, clean house, if I was done with, with VIV, right, I could say, okay, show me VIV, right? And then I could say, on the sidebar menu, I want to select all. It would mark them in the left-hand side. And then I could say, I want to clean. I want to remove them all. And then I would then, then they would be gone. They'd be done. They'd be out. So that's what clean house is. It's a fast way of inactivating large groups of items that are eligible. If you don't see an item, it's because it's not eligible, right? If, if you find that you need to go clean up your other data, then you need to go clean up your other data, right? I mean, that's what it is. So um, on POs, we used to run the heck out of reports in POs, but we don't, we don't do that anymore. Uh, the filtered view is amazingly powerful. So in a filtered view, I'm gonna point out that, that I could, and I don't know why, like the default filter doesn't have ship date. Like you need ship date. Like why wouldn't you have ship date? Ship date's like the most important date. Order date, that's just the arbitrary date you typed it in. And cancel date is the day you're done with it, right? Ship date's the only real date. Anyway, so clear all uh, in, in, in the order date or the ship date or the cancel date, really, to be honest. Um, I can take any date and I can say whatever, 010101 through T enter, right? Show me things that are passed to the ship date. And you probably will find items that are past the ship date. Let's face it, it's not uncommon for an item to be a day late, a two days late, a week late, a month late. After a month, you gotta start questioning what's going on, but you know, vendors aren't the most timely in the world in getting their stuff out. So, ah, so sorry, I missed a question. Clean house, just bulk and activate items, correct? Yes, that's correct, yes. It does not delete them. No, version nine doesn't delete them. So um, everybody should really understand that this is a relational database. This is an ODBC, Open Database Connectivity, right? ODBC compliant database. So the descriptions only exist in one place, right? So, so for instance, uh, let's see here if I can make this clear quickly and easily. So here is a receipt. That one came through um, from a from a um, from a mobile point of sale. You can tell by the um, receipt number. Anyway, so if I take an item here, okay, this this will work, right? So this item seven 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 right here, right, is a small, right? Okay. This is receipt number seventy. Perfect. Let's get out of here. Let's go back into inventory. And let's find, uh, is it ALU777? We'll find out here, won't we? 777, is that the one? Small? I don't even remember. Let's do, let's do this here. Size, SML, how many are there? 
and it's actually more than I thought. All right, fine. So if I uh, do this, then uh, I'm going to get that error on all these, aren't I? That's just special. Really should go kill that plugin, shouldn't I? Does everybody know what a plugin is? Plugin is a, a third party application that's been dropped into Retail Pro to do something. Um, in this case, it's like partially installed and it's probably missing something, and I just have been blown off trying to fix it off. Hey, thanks. Uh, appreciate your time today. I understand it's going a little long, so I taken off there to have you you have a good one appreciate it um yes you'll be able to uh access the rest of the webinar they're going to email out a link to it when we're done and that we would get the recording done so anyway um when i changed this definition one of those was for sure our item right so i'm going to click save and this error one more time and then we're going to go back and we're going to look at the receipt and see what happened, right? Now, in version 8, in all previous versions of Retail Pro, if, if I'd done what I just did, it would have not affected the receipt like it did just now. It's a relational database. If we delete the item, its history would be deleted off the receipt, if that makes sense. So... You can't have a discrepancy between inventory and history. It's a relational database. The description only exists once in inventory. That is the reporting. That is all history. So um, anyway, so um, and hopefully that, that answers your question on, on whether it deletes it or inactivates it. You can think of it in inactivation as like putting something in the basement, like getting rid of it sending it downstairs right gone but because really once you inactivate it you can't sell it if you scan it at the point of sale it says beep not found it's not there once it's inactivated it's gone so all right so um right back to purchase orders and maintenance real quick um every buyer should be going into po's doing a filtered view on a weekly basis checking on the status of their orders right look for things that are past cancel look for things that are past ship nothing should ever make it past cancel right if i give you 90 days to ship this product if i say ship tomorrow and cancel date is 90 days from today and it makes it past cancel and i haven't gotten it you guys you got a problem i mean you got to be looking for that stuff before it gets to be that old right so it should have been received against and inactivated long before the cancel date. Or you should be kicking that vendor's butt. That's all I got to say on that one. Right? So the filtered view is better than a report because you can run this, you can filter it for the buyer, you can filter it for the date range, you can filter it for the vendor, you can see everything you want to see. And then you can just pop in here and go form view, you can look at the orders, you can go next, you can scroll through them, you can you can inactivate them right here. You can take action. You could you could edit the ship date. Okay, I'll call the vendor. Oh, the vendor had a problem. I'm going to extend the ship date. Boom, boom. Here's the new cancel date. Right? If you if you run your report here, you can actually work it real time. It's a beautiful thing. Anyway, um, right. And that is in fact the last section that we're supposed to be covering. So it's kind of good that we bumped into that. Um, and there's another aspect of that I guess we should probably take a look at. Um, so, uh, and the importance basically of PO and SO maintenance is both POs and SOs, they commit items. So they tie the item up. They prevent it from being cleaned house until you inactivate those. And you don't want to wait five years and then have to clean up five years worth of orders. That's just a huge pain in the butt. Um, there is out here in, in uh, tool land, there's the technician's toolkit. The technician's toolkit, in case anybody doesn't know, is your like window into the Oracle database, right? So things that are, well, all things that Oracle, shall we say, um, like looking into the Oracle database, for instance, uh, would be here, right? This is the technician's toolkit. 
and I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what this table right here is. Description one, description two, description three, description four, attribute, size, right? That's the inventory table, right? Everybody's on board with that. So um, now out here, there are some functions you can do. There's a purge function. So at some point when you get to be like to the point where I'm just really done, I've been cleaning up my POs, but I've got POs in there for 10 years. There's a purge function down here. You can go down and you could purge your PO, the really old stuff. That would permanently delete it. That would drop it out, like gone out. So just an FYI that's out here. There's also two nodes down here at the bottom that I find particularly interesting, the inventory and miscellaneous ones right down here at the bottom. And the reason that I find these interesting is because there's a ton of little fixes in here. Recalculate company on hand quantity. So if you have more than one store and you got two in each store, you got five stores, it should be 10 on hand for company and it says you got 12, just check this button off and recalculate company on hand, right? I mean, that's what that is. Uh, recal, recal committed, very important. Committed is, is, is a number that's tracked as to how many is on order in a purchase order, in a sales order, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, a great many functions, including clean house, use that to determine whether the item is eligible, right? So if you just went in and cleaned up your POs, like you just spent a week cleaning up all your POs, it would be wise to come out here to the technician's toolkit, down to the inventory mode, check off, recalculate, committed, click start, and then wait for that little start button to come back, which usually doesn't take terribly long. Of course, now that I'm showing it to you, it's taking longer than it ever has in my recent memory, but um, really, like a minute would be a long time here. So, not sure why our database isn't running quicker. Probably because I don't go out and play with this one too much. Anyway, uh, recalculate, recalculate committed would freshen that committed value up, would reevaluate all those statuses and make sure that when you go into clean house, you're not missing something that you should be seeing, right? That's what that does. Anyway, there's other things out here. Recalculate dates, uh, rebuild your style links, uh, update the delta. Um, there's a lot of functions out here that you might use from time to time that are pretty handy. Anyway, um, that's pretty much all I have on my agenda. Um, is there any questions anyone wants to throw out there, either on the phone or in the chat? Is there anything that I haven't covered that we somebody would like to beat me up on? We got like 20 minutes, so we could go longer if we want. It's amazing you guys have hung in there this long, though. An hour and 40 is a long time. I appreciate it. All right, then. Well, if, if you guys don't have anything else, I'm going to tell you thank you very much for attending. Uh, certainly appreciate it. We always appreciate it here at Big Hairy Dog. And if you do want any doc designs, please feel free to email me. Uh, I will be glad to give send you back any whatever you want, and uh, have a great weekend, everyone. All right, then I'm going to sign off, and uh, thanks again for all your support there. I love when people participate. You guys have a good one.